Okay. Uh, I, I hope that you all can leave today knowing what it is that you want and also feeling confident to ask for it. Um, so my name is Sui Lang Pinoke. I serve as one of the ambassadors for the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Um, and I have the honor of introducing our speakers today. Uh, so the first one, uh, we're going to start off with Jessica Egbert. She is the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Engagement at Rocky Mountain University um, of Health Professions, uh, where she promotes data-driven mission uh, and mission fulfillment. She also serves on the director as a director of the Utah Women in Ed Higher Education Network. Um, she's on the board of the Utah Valley Chamber of Commerce, the Utah Valley University Community Advisory Council, the Business Q Editorial Board, and the Provo City Economic Development Strategic Planning Plan Steering Committee. Um, she, her education, a little bit about her education, she got her bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's of education degree in instructional technology, and a doctor of philosophy degree in educational leadership. So um, Michelle is extremely highly educated um, and knowledgeable on this topic. Our other speaker, our second speaker, will be Michelle Bates, who is vice president for marketing at Kuali Incorporated, um, an educational technology firm. Uh, she also worked for many years at Helix Education. Um, she was executive director of digital marketing, uh, digital media and marketing for the Daily Herald. She has over 15 years of leadership marketing content, communications, research, and digital experience. Um, she also completed her undergrad in anthropology with a minor in world history at BYU and going on to completing her master's of science and social work at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So this is Michelle. And our third speaker is Anjali Pai, I believe. Uh, PAI is the director of staff development at Salt Lake Community College. Um, prior to Salt Lake's uh, working at SLIC, Pai spent over 10 years actively engaged in interna the internationalization efforts at the University of Utah. Uh, it was during this time that she developed a passion for creating strong leadership and mentoring programs, emphasizing institutional collaboration and inclusion. Um, she's also done work in Singapore, in Sydney, Australia. Australia. She holds a master's degree in educational leadership and policy from the University of Utah and is a certified leadership coach. Um, she's also currently the past chair of the board of directors of the Utah Women in Higher Education Network. So it is an honor to have all of these phenomenal women uh, speaking to us today. And I just have one suggestion. How many of you have a smartphone? Yeah? Okay. I want you to pull out your smartphones and I want you to take notes. I want you to jot down the most important things that you hear each one of these women um, say today, so no pressure to all of you. But uh, the speaker, did anyone learn anything new from hearing from the president of UVU just now? I just wanted to share with you three things that I wrote down as kind of examples of what you can jot down from each of these ladies. So number one, go for the biggest job you're not qualified for, right? Exclamation point. Be responsible for your own happiness. And thirdly, leadership is not sustainable without self-care. And that includes getting rid of the guilt when asking for what you want. So I'm very excited to turn the time over to Jessica, and we'll go to Michelle, and then to Anjali. Thank you, thank you. Boy, thank you. I think that should be for like the best welcome ever. <laughs> I would have her do my intro every time, except for you could cut short. Mine is like a big snoozer. Um, well, thank you guys for coming out. We're so glad to have you with us. We hope that you'll get some interesting tidbits of, out of what we have to share with you today. I do not guarantee that I'll be able to tell you what you want. I do not know that I'm aware of that necessarily, of everything in my life. But if you have some major revelation, do take notes about what you want. That's a great point. This presentation was inspired by actually Susan Madsen, who inspires a whole lot of things for me. And um, she wanted us to talk about something that seems familiar to women, to the culture, and not only women. So I'm glad we have some men in the room. This is certainly not a topic that's isolated to, to women. All right, so our outcomes. In higher ed, you always have to have outcomes for everything you do. Who's in higher ed? Okay, so you have to have like an outcome for everything. So these are the things you will learn before you leave this room. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about neuro neurology and how our brains shape how we perceive the world and perceive reality, perceive ourselves. And then we'll talk a little bit about leadership, our own potential. We'll talk about culture and environment. 
Then we're going to connect it about ourselves, and you're going to have a little bit of an activity with that. I'm going to press it again. <gasps> it worked that time. Okay, Vanna might have to, uh, if I call her back, it's a conspiracy. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, neurology. There is a difference between men and women's brains. This has been proven time and time again, and so we want to go into that. It's important to understand the difference in our wiring so that we can understand the difference in how we communicate. The more we learn about communication, the better we can communicate. It's not a matter of knowing what's, who is better, who is worse. It's just knowing what is different. And so if we understand how our brains are wired, then we can improve those strategies. We can increase the likelihood to get what we want, right? Oh, look, it worked again. That was a good one. Okay. So difference between men and women's brains. So here's men's brain wiring 101. And so we're going to do some basic neuroscience right here. So men are hardwired for hard sciences. They are the ones who wired for nature. You hear a nature versus nurture example. So men are connected to nature. They have a larger amygdala, which is competitiveness, action, aggression. Whenever I hear amygdala, for some reason, I still think of the medulla oblongata, which is my, if you know the reference, it's my husband's favorite movie, Waterboy. And so that's what I always think of, talking about men's, it's the medulla oblongata. So that's where that comes from. But so the, amyg the amygdala, this is a fact. Your brain is physiologically different. Men from women, women from men. It is what it is. Women, here you go. <laughs> Here's what makes women a little different. So any men who are like, what? You're right, you're right. We got a lot going on up there. It's different, that's okay. Ladies, own it. We are more wired for soft sciences. We are more wired for the nurture of things. Now, this research is not to say there aren't, um, uh, there aren't outliers. Of course there are. These are generalizations. Um, we have more active anterior cortex. We're more likely to worry. We analyze to death, right? The dudes in the room are like, yeah. Tell my wife to stop. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, our larger prefrontal cortex, we connect to decision making. We connect to emotions. We manage the amygdala. I'm just going to leave that there. Um, we're better we better at sense, sensing. We see patterns of information. Um, we have more connections between between information. So, uh, if you've ever been accused of bringing up something that happened like a decade ago, yeah, that's legit. Our brains are designed to do that. So just own it. It is what it is. <laughs> And sometimes it's fantastic, right? Because we can see patterns in our behaviors. We can see patterns in things. We can sense the room better. Those things are fantastic qualities. Do they also create issues between gender, between how we communicate, between how we perceive ourselves? Absolutely. But let's learn about that. Let's embrace that. If you ever want to know what a woman's brain is like, Imagine a browser with 752 tabs open all the time. I'm not saying we're awesome at, at surfing all of those tabs all the time, right? They just are open all the time. You saw that from the science from the last slide. Those are things that are constantly going on in a woman's brain all the time. So things are different for us. We perceive the world differently. We receive information differently. We translate information differently which affects how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others, and that affects how we get what we want. So uh, an example of how these things translate differently. What are you thinking about? Have you ever asked that question to a dude? <laughs> men, men in the room, if I asked you, what are you thinking about? You know I'm pointing at you. He doesn't want to do it. Okay. BYU shirt. What are you thinking about? Uh, 
Oh my gosh, I actually deleted that slide from this presentation. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's hilarious. Pull up the Barbara Annis book. Okay, there actually is a slide, <laughs> but I deleted it last night. So it's, it's the woman's brain at rest and the men's brain at rest, right? So man's brain at rest lights up like one section, and a woman's brain at rest lights up a bajillion sections. And that doesn't say we're, men are smarter, women are smarter, whatever. It's just literally when you ask a man, what are you thinking about, and they say nothing, I'm thinking about nothing. Women, don't get on their case. They are thinking about nothing. And that's okay, right? It's okay, let them think about nothing. We don't have that luxury sometimes. So if you ask a woman, what are you thinking about? My kids and my work, my business, whoa. Me too. So you gotta watch for that. You gotta watch for how are we how are we treating our guys when they say nothing? Are we going, no, really? What are you thinking about? How do you feel? That's our problem, not their problem, right? Read the room, okay? How about it's fine? Any guys get into trouble over that one? I've gotten into trouble over it. It's fine. I use that a lot. And now my two-year-old, I was literally just telling my friends, my two-year-old little boy started saying this week, fine. <laughs> Two. Yeah. So it's fine. Does that mean the same thing to a woman as it does to a guy in general? No. Dude can say, it's fine. Probably it's just fine. Leave them alone. <laughs> woman says, it's fine. Dudes, watch out. It does not mean that most of the time. Okay, nodding in agreement. Now this is actually one of my favorites because it really affects um, business committees, things like that that you're working on. A lot of times if you are engaged, for example, if I'm in a conversation with a superior Caucasian male and he's expressing to me an idea that he has and he's sharing me, this is the direction I believe we should go in our strategic plan. And I go like this. He may receive that as me saying, I agree with you. We should do that. In the reality, what am I saying? See, I'm, I'm listening. Very, very different messages we send. So that's one that actually has been a reality check for me as I've thought about it and observed my own behavior a little bit more is that that simple active listening skill that I perceive as being good active listening can easily be misinterpreted as agreement. Have you seen that happen in your own lives? I've seen it at home, I've seen it at work, but especially at work. So I think that's, for me, that was an eye opener. It was an interesting one. So leadership, I wanna go into leadership. Now that we have kind of some foundation about the differences in, in gendered communication, that there's neuroscience behind it, that we've seen some examples of how that translates into um, social settings. Leadership is evolving. So historically, leadership has had very masculine characteristics. They're assertive, they're aggressive, they're decisive, these things. And then now, leadership, the perspective is changing, and the research on leadership is changing to become more holistic, more relationship-based. Better, more effective leaders are perceived to have stronger relationships. Who has more of those nurturing characteristics? Women, right? However, there's still a gap that we have to resolve where both women and men still perceive those historically masculine characteristics to be essential for leaders. So when a woman gets up there who is authoritative or decisive, both women and men are still like, whoa, you just broke my brain because you're supposed to be nurturing. So we all have to check ourselves on that little bit either. That's where that bullying or pushy word comes in or other words that I'm not going to use right now. <laughs> so. So leadership is changing. Research on leadership has proven this. I wanna talk about that for a little bit. So there's a study by Zanger Folkman, which is a local group. 
who looked at 200,000 assessments and 1,900 behaviors of 49 leadership competencies, okay? The women leaders who were rated turned out to be more effective overall than the male leaders. Women, as Dr. Tamina said, they could be the secret to success. So it's not a matter of even just at the leadership role, it's a matter of bringing them from the bottom. They're the secret to organizational success. In fact, there's been so much research about companies with more women on their boards make more money. It's, it's transactional at this point. In fact, you've probably seen the, the current articles of California requiring women on boards. Isn't that an interesting thing? I don't quite know how I feel about it, but it's an interesting development. Okay, leadership competencies. You probably can't see this super well. The side ones might be a little clearer. These are some of the leadership competencies that proved significant in the Zanger Folkman study. So you can see, and you can't tell the colors here, but the coloring on the sides will tell you those top, that top section, those are leadership competencies that proved statistically significant where women leaders were rated by their peers and subordinates to be significantly better than males. Look at what those are. Takes initiative, drives for results, practices self-development, displays high integrity, develops others, inspires and motivates others, champions change, builds relationship, establishes stretch goals, collaboration and teamwork, connects to the outside world, solves problems, analyzes issues, communicates powerfully, and innovates. Oh, innovates is the one neutral. It wasn't significantly different. Men and women are about the same with innovates. Pretty cool, huh? And then men, were significantly better at technical and professional expertise and developing strategic perspective. So what does this mean? This is what it means. And this is what I would emphasize to this whole room. Good leadership has nothing to do with your gender. Whether you are male or female or have not defined that, it does not matter. What matters is your leadership competencies your skills, again, that says women have the capacity, but it also says that men have the capacity. What is statistically significant are having those competencies, okay? So what I wanna emphasize again, gender doesn't define good leaders. Your behaviors define good leadership. And this, um, a lot of this information, Barbara Annis has this book on same words, different language, and this is one of my favorite things I've heard her say. It's not about fixing each other. It's about honoring each other. We are complementary, but by understanding that and recognize each other and what everyone brings to the table, there is so much greater opportunity to success. press the right button. Hey, my button's still working. See, good things. I'm manifesting a button working. So, totally believe in that. Um, I believe in strength-based leadership. There's a lot of research saying that you can focus on your weaknesses as much as you want, but you're only going to make great ground on emphasizing your strengths as a leader and allow others to fill in the gaps with their strengths. So I would challenge you to consider on this list, these are the lists from, that we already reviewed, to think of three things on that list that you think are strengths. I guarantee each of you has a minimum of three things you're really good at and could continue to magnify. So strength-based leadership, taking your strengths and just leveling up on those strengths, okay? So keep those in mind as we move, move on to the next section which is part deal. We're gonna bring Michelle up now. <laughs> I don't know if I'm coordinated enough for this. All right, we'll give him a, hey. All right, it's a little, it's getting close to my bedtime and they gave us water and not diet soda. <laughs> which I think is a mistake, I'm just saying. Okay, so we are going to do a deep dive into how cultural and environmental complexities affect confidence and perceived power. And I use the word perception because that's actually what we're gonna talk mostly about. So Jessica handled the science 
and I'm going to handle the soft science. That's what I like to call it. The social and emotional pieces of gender. We are going to talk about how, if at all, culture and environment shape our ideas of power and confidence. What is the gender gap? Is it real, perceived, both? What is power? How is power different by gender across cultures? There's an extra by, but you don't have to notice that. <laughs> how do you own your own gender power? And how do you feel confident in individualizing your asks and needs? How do you feel confident in asking for what you actually want? Because that's the trick, right? So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. I want to talk to you a little bit first about the idea of culture and environment and how they shape our ideas of power and confidence. Because they do. It's all about perception. So I've been up here long enough for you guys to notice that I'm dressed like this. It's not how you usually dress when you give a presentation. I give a lot of presentations. I'm usually supposed to dress different. But I called Jess and I'm like, I'm gonna wear a sweatshirt, mostly because I wanted to, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but um, as I was standing up here, I want you guys to honestly think about, did you notice that? Did you wonder? Did you feel like, as a professional, I should be dressed different or better? Or did you just appreciate the fact it's Harry Potter? Because that's OK, because it is. I'm cool with that. I've spent most of my career defining myself because I'm a marketer. So I'm the VP of marketing. So that's what I do. And I understand perception and definitions. And so for most of my career, I've had to dress very professional. I turned 40 quite a few years ago, we'll just leave it at that. And when I turned 40, I was like, I don't wanna dress like that anymore. And so I went into interviews and instead of asking about pay, instead of asking about offices, the first thing I'd usually ask is, can I wear jeans? How do you feel about that? What's the cultural environment like here? Because that mattered to me. When I called Jess and talked to her and asked her if I could wear jeans, uh, <laughs> we had this funny conversation and she said I could share it because she had the same thought about wearing high heels because you may have noticed I'm rather short <laughs> and she's very tall. And she thought, I don't know if I'm supposed to wear high heels because I'll, I'll ac accentuate how short you are. I'm like, that's okay, I'm really used to it. And she's like, but I just wore the high heels anyway, so it doesn't matter. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit more about tonight. Why does it matter? What matters to you? What would you ask for in a given situation and why? And how does your culture and environment play into those asks? As women and men in our society today, people define those for us and they shouldn't. So how do we define them for ourselves and make those choices for ourselves? Okay, culture influences thinking, language, and human behavior. The social environment in which individuals are born and live shapes their attitudinal, emotional, and behavioral reactions. There's a bajillion studies that back this up. It just sort of is. And that's a very good book if you'd like to read it. What I want you to do for the next few seconds here is look at the pictures I'm going to share with you. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm not going to give you information on them. I just want you to think about what, what comes to mind when you see them. Each one of these pictures represents a powerful person or a powerful situation, mostly women. That jacket's awesome. How can you not include Oprah? I mean, right. The only thing that's consistent in those pictures is they're different. And a lot of them wouldn't have meant anything to you unless, as like me, you wasted your undergraduate on the best degree ever, anthropology. <laughs> knowing you were gonna to go to graduate school, so it was fine. <laughs> um, this might be one of the most iconic photos of female empowerment in the United States. 
It's Rosie the Riveter, right? And this is a really cool one. Actually, this year, there was a 3D printing company that was running a huge campaign where people could make their own printing things to kind of reimagine this. It was a very cool campaign. But Rosie the Riveter is a really interesting, iconic symbol. Because during World War II, that was a marketing campaign, in case you guys are wondering. Probably one of the best ones that was ever run. Except diamonds, they're a scam. Just saying, we could talk about it later. <laughs> Rosie the Riveter was a marketing campaign at a time when women didn't work. It was culturally unusual for a female to work. But it was World War II, it was 1942. The men were all at war and as a country, we had to stay afloat, right? And we didn't have people to do anything. We didn't have people to run the post office, and we didn't have people to run the machines. And we couldn't make the things that we needed to stay alive as a country. And so we created a campaign that essentially told women, hey, it's OK. All that stuff we said before doesn't matter. It's cool. Go to work. We need you. This will work. Hence Rosie the Riveter. She has had a huge resurgence over the last two years because a lot of things have happened here in the United States that made us all think about gender equality. We have the Me Too movement that's still happening right now. We have pay gap conversations. Provo manages to make it to the bottom of the list every year. Go Provo. That's where I live. <laughs> and we have a decisive lack of women in CEO positions. But the great, the great thing about these, actually, is that it started the conversation of why. Oops, wrong way. Why, why is that the case? Why do we have a pay gap? Why do we ha not have enough women in leadership positions? And it started a really interesting conversation about the confidence gap. How many of you guys have heard about the confidence gap? OK, so for those of you guys who don't know, there's a study out of Cornell that essentially said uh, men on average, believe themselves to be better and more qualified at things than they are, and women on average think we suck. <laughs> Just a thing, I don't know. The study went on to talk about something that a lot of people don't really think too much about. Women on average, so it's always on average, not everybody, but women on average worry a lot more about whether people like them they worry about whether or not they're being bossy. They worry about whether or not they're being community-centered and good communicators. And all of those things make them seem not confident. And so there's this conversation that there's a confidence gap, right? But is there? In Berlin, they did a really fascinating study on the confidence gap, and here's what they found. So white isn't a color, it's actually a person. She's a working mother of two. <laughs> um, she set up her first company at age 24, and this is what she said. For me and for most women I know, true confidence is the ability to be openly vulnerable and honest in any environment, and it's those qualities we are more likely to respond to and aspire to, especially in the workplace. The research that was pu published by Gillian holds that women viewed as self-confident are any more likely to get ahead than those who are not. Instead, her research has found that for more women, gaining influence at work is more closely retied to their warmth and caring qualities. Essentially, what the study found is that confidence and the perception of it differs between men and women. It's not that we lack confidence, it's that we think confidence is something different. And that's fascinating to me. My undergraduate was I studied matrilineal societies, which is essentially women whose family and name and fortunes run through the women's side. It's still a patriarchal society, so the men are in charge in the homes. But all of your money and your name go through the women. And I found in my studies that because both of those things mattered, there was less gender inequality. It was fascinating. And I came home, and for the last 20 years, one of the things that's fascinated me the most is, what is power? It's different across societies. It's different across people. What I've come to understand is that owning your own perspective on power is what counts. What do you think power is? You are allowed to create your own idea of individual equality. If you're going to take a picture of anything, take a picture of that. Because I mean this. I tell my kids this all the time. It's up to you to decide what matters to you and then to go after it and try to achieve it. 
Individual equality can mean better pay for some people, more time off for some people, flexibility. I have two kids with disabilities. My first 10 years, I never negotiated pay once. All I asked for was flexibility for hospital visits because that's what mattered to me as a person. Feedback matters for some people, title, benefits, opportunity. But at the end of the day, it's different for all of us. What does it mean to you? So ask and you shall receive. How do you gain confidence to individualize your asks and your needs? Basically, we recommend you just ask. It's harder than that though, right? It's hard. It's I mean, I really struggle with it. I, I'm not great. But I love this quote. It's from a Huffington Post writer named Jenna Cho. She said, if I could encourage women to do one thing, it would be to ask for what you want. Stop overthinking every simple, it's not so simple sometimes, right? Request, and just ask. Ask without apology. Ask despite your inner critic. Ask when you fear you will be seen as pushy or bossy or all those words we never wanna say. Ask when you fear you'll be laughed at. Ask despite fear of rejection. Ask when you fear you don't deserve it. Ask when you feel you do. When that little voice tells you that you're not smart enough, you don't know enough, you don't have enough, you haven't done enough to ask, for heaven's sakes, just ask anyway. There was a really incredible study that came out a few years ago from Hewlett Packard. And the study basically said that within their company, they had a lot more male executives and they wanted to understand why. And what it came down to is male executives would apply for leadership positions only having 60% of the qualifications that were necessary to sort of be qualified for that job, but they went for it. Guess what percentage women went for? 100%. <laughs> but we wouldn't apply for anything unless we felt within our soul that we had 100% of those requirements. Don't stretch yourself, try, go after the things that matter. It's not that we're not getting things because we're trying, we're not getting things because we're not. I talked to a whole bunch of my friends over the last couple weeks and I wanted to understand if they could tell you guys anything, what would they tell you? And these are the eight things they came up with. Remember that you are not alone. That awesome sexy pants over there, Jessica, eight years ago, maybe, she created a group of us, there weren't very many female executives in the Valley. And she created a lunch, Power Chicks and Pastries. We ate a lot of pastries, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> we like them. And we would get together once a month and we would talk about what we were up against because we felt alone. I was the only woman of 27 executives at my company. I had a lot of questions that I didn't have answers to. So we found each other and we learned from each other. And seven years later, all of us are in higher paid positions. We're better off in our careers. We're way older. Lots of other stuff has happened, but we had each other. Don't be shy about negotiating for your own interests because who else is gonna, right? Provide a legitimate explanation for your negotiation. Don't be shy about saying, this is why this matters to me. I don't wanna wear dresses to work every day because nylon's kind of chafe, you know? It's, I don't like it. Um, and I'm okay asking for that now. I wasn't when I was your age. I wish I could go back and do it again because I bought way too many pairs of nylons. And I probably could have gotten it. You need to toot your own horn to get what you want. Tooting your horn does not mean you're a weirdo narcissistic freak. It means you're just saying, I did a great job at this. How can I do better next time? What would you suggest? Let people know what you're accomplishing and what you're doing. Because on the first hand, they can have you do more of those things because you rocked at it. But on the second hand, you deserve to be acknowledged for the things you rock at. Raise your hand more. Sit at the table. Be part of the dialogue. Be part of the discussion. All of these things are in your control and your power. No one's holding you back from doing these things except you. Ask for training that can propel you. If there's something you want to learn and you know you need to learn it to do better at your job, do not be afraid to ask. The only thing that can happen is they say no and then you're doing the same thing you are now, which is nothing, so ask. Build strong friendships, partnerships, mentorships, sponsorships. Build your own ships that will take you where you need to go. Nobody knows everything on their own. You need people to help you. Um, there's this really cool saying that women, are really good at pulling each other up. 
So if someone's beneath you, you're really awesome at pulling them up where you are. We're not always as awesome at lifting them above us. You need to be a lifter and a puller because if you lift somebody up, then they're gonna be up there to pull you up. It's a mistake not to, so do both. And finally, just make asking a habit. It's not something that comes natural to most people. You have to kind of work on it. So if you can work on it when you're younger and build a habit, it will help propel you through the rest of your career. All right. Yay, the best part. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being so attentive. Um, so this is the last part. Um, this is kind of the, the part that we talked about earlier, which is really the workshop part. So this is where you'll practice. You'll actually do some scenarios where you're going to practice asking for what you want. Um, she was talking about just asking. We actually have developed um, a, a three-step kind of uh, model for you to ask for what you want. Um, what Jessica said earlier was really interesting, right? She said, gender doesn't define good leadership. Good behavior, and I would argue, and I'm sure they would as well, that good communication also defines good leadership. So it's one thing to just ask, but how do you ask, right? And we, we really um, thought this three-step approach is, is a way to do it. And you will hear me explain how to do it, and then you will practice. You'll practice with the person next to you, and we've got some sheets underneath your chairs that hopefully everybody has one. If not, we've got some extras for you. So the, th the three steps. Um, they start with the first one, which is to state the facts and starting with facts. What that means is um, you actually, when you're asking for what you want, right, there could be a variety of things. You could be asking for a raise. You could be asking for something um, at home, like you want your kid's room to be clean. Um, you could want it, you want to be involved in the community. But starting with the facts. So what would be the facts of this situation? Um, you would be asking for you'd be stating something very clearly, starting with the facts. So it could be something like, I've noticed your room is not clean. I would like to share um, my experiences with you in marketing. I can see that you are not completing assignments on time. So you are just stating what you see, hear, and observe, right? So that's the first part of what you're gonna do when you practice. So stating the facts means that you don't use things like jokes or sarcasm, you're just stating the facts. Um, you don't offer compliments, say, to start the conversation. Um, you don't use absolutes like always and ever. You're simply stating what you see and observe. And this can be sometimes very complicated, too. Sometimes in gendered conversations, we th say things like, I'm really sorry, but I want to talk to you about something really important. Or I just want to tell you something that's been bothering me. Or maybe as a boss, you say, um, Again, I'm really sorry, there's, some, there's a performance issue I need to talk with you about. So instead of using all of those kinds of phraseologies, instead you're going to state the facts. You're going to say what you've seen, noticed, and observed. And this is, this is um, something that takes practice because it's a very simple tool, it's a very strategic tool, but it actually takes practice. And that's what we'll, we'll have you do. Um, so it's stating the facts. The second step in this model, lead with curiosity. This, I think, is the most important and probably one of the hardest things to do. What it involves is actually asking questions. So you're saying things like, I'm noticing, I'm sensing. You're asking the person what's going on. And what's important about this is you want to stay curious in dialogue, right? You want to ask the other person a question so that you're inviting the dialogue. If you just come into the conversation and you talk the whole time and you don't ask the other person's opinion, there is no dialogue, right? It's just you talking. And so asking for that other person's opinion um, is, is what we call in um, crucial conversations training, I don't know if any of you have gone through that, is that shared meaning, right? So if I simply ask you in a conversation, what's your opinion about this? How do you see it? 
I mean, you, you can imagine when you're in a conversation with somebody, if somebody just asks you for your opinion, how validating that is and how important that is. And that's really critical. Step two there, leading with curiosity, that's a very, very effective tool that we teach leaders all the time across our college. How can you step back in that situation and invite the other person into the dialogue? It really does take skill and practice because very often you have things that you want to say, things that you want to accomplish, and sometimes you forget. Maybe if I just need to pause and ask this person, ask them to be invited into the conversation, it will, it will go a lot further. Oh, well, we will demonstrate that as well in a minute. Again, this helps you stay in dialogue and helps you stay curious. So the last part, step three, is confirm with action and accountability. Very often in conversations, I think we forget to ask for this follow-up, this piece on accountability. So this is really confirming the part about getting what you want, confirming at the end of the conversation what will actually be done, and offering a choice to a person, whether it's a community member, a boss, a supervisor, um, a coworker, an employee, um, or your teenager. Um, it's very important to confirm um, what the other person will do, and again, by offering a choice, this can be a very, very powerful um, strategic communication tool, right? So it can be as simple as, can you make that work by 8 or 8.15? Are you going to clean your room now or after soccer practice? Because both choices are actually what you want. You're just giving the choice, right? Many of you know this tool. This is a very, very powerful tool. And when you learn it, and you learn it well, it works everywhere so brilliantly. I am a master at this. My kids, my two teenage boys, I'm telling you, they, they're so used to it that they know every choice that I give them is going to be what I want, right? They either, they either have to do the dishwasher or they have to take the garbage out. But either way, I get it. It's done. But they, it's, it's presented as a choice. So it's pretty powerful. So are you ready to practice? Come on up here, ex teenager. So Michelle and I are just going to role play out, and I want you to listen for the three steps, OK? I'm going to be the exasperated mother. Michelle is going to be the uh, know-it-all teenager. And our scenario is, is that the teen has chores to do each week, items like picking up her room, doing the dishes, taking out the trash. Um, I've noticed that she's not getting these things done, and it's really starting to bother me, so it's time for a conversation. And um, we're going to model for you the uh, three-step approach. Hi. So I, I've noticed that the dishes have really been piling up. Um, in fact, they're to the edge of the sink. I'm really stressed out right now, Mom. I mean, you should know that I have a lot going on with soccer and everything. Is there something that I can do to help you with your stress so that you can still get your chores done on time? <sighs> like what? I don't know. How about you work on your homework when you get home from school? Take a break, relax a bit, have dinner, and then do the dishes? Fine. OK, so it sounds like you have a plan. You're going to get your homework and chores done while keeping your stress levels down? Sounds like a plan, whatever. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so the idea with that is that we, uh, we use the three-step approach there. And obviously, every conversation you have, there are, there are little subtleties that come up, which can sometimes give some resistance in the conversation. But if you generally stick with this three-step model, um, stating the facts, leading with curiosity, and then confirming with action, um, very often you will find that you can ask for what you want and not feel guilty about it. Um, and I encourage you to think about this as you try some scenarios yourself. So under your chairs, there are three different scenarios. There, um, the scenarios are community, home, and work. Um, you're going to work with a partner next to you, around you, whatever you want to do. Just um, pick a person and pick one scenario. Um, how long do they have, Jessica? I think we said 
eight minutes, and we'll let you know um, when time is up. But what we want you to do is we want you, one person is going to, you can read the scenario, and then um, go through the model and state the facts, lead with curiosity and confirm with action, and have the other person give you feedback. And then you're welcome to switch and try another scenario if you have time in the eight minutes. But go ahead and practice these three things, and then at the end we'll wrap up and see if you have any questions about the model. Okay? Good luck. Hi, everybody. So I'm, I'm really curious if anyone would like to share their experience with following this three-step model. Did you um, find that you could ask for what you want with ease? Was there, was there any challenging part that you'd like to share? Yes. Good point. Yeah. So she, I'll repeat the question or the comment. What she said is she finds in the stating the facts part, it's hard to stop talking. It seems like you just want to kind of keep going and going and, and, and softening it and that um, it'd just be easier to maybe just state the fact. What do you guys think about that? Any other comments? Yes? She found herself to be a bit more confident. What do you think gave you the confidence? Knowing stuff about your brain? Mm. Okay, so did you, she said she felt more confidence and feeling brave, and did you give a choice in the conversation? Yeah, choices are very empowering, right? They really can, especially when they're both outcomes or what you really want. So when you craft it that way, it is very empowering. <laughs> yes, it's a very clever strategy, I would say. Yes, so I'm glad you felt more confident. Any other feedback on the model? Do you think you can practice it and use it? Yes? Yes, being asked a question, being invited into the dialogue, um, some of the competencies that um, Jessica mentioned, these are really very, very wonderful strengths, motivating others, collaborating, um, that managing conflict, they're really wonderful leadership competencies, and being able to frame them as a question is a wonderful skill. And if you can learn how to do that, um, even if you just Google leadership competencies and you Google even a coach approach, um, that's one of the references that we've cited in this, um, this PowerPoint, um, you'll see there are a lot of ways to frame things as a question, and that's very inviting into dialogue. So I really encourage you to do that. And that's why I said I think step, step two is, is actually my favorite part of this, uh, asking for what you want. Yes? So this three-step is, um, I would say it's taken from Crucial Conversations, which I'm certified to train in. And then also it's a little bit from um, Parenting with Love and Logic, probably the last part. Um, but it's also from um, just my experience being a certified coach, because asking questions in a question kind of modality is a, is a coach kind of approach. Those references are also in the back of our um, PowerPoint. Yeah, so I would say that the, this three-step model is something that we use at Salt Lake Community College all the time with our leaders, um, but it's kind of a blend of some of those approaches. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Exactly. 
Yes, there's there's lots and lots of research too about the way that we communicate and we, we didn't go there with this, we just wanted to do a quick three-step approach with you um, given the time that we had. But yeah, there are, there are a lot of really great tips about not saying I'm sorry, not um, phrasing things in a way that um, leaves you feeling pretty disempowered. So yeah, it's good that you stuck with us. Did somebody have one last comment? Yes. Yeah, th I think these steps, they do actually help help you feel more accountable and help the other person feel more accountable. It's why we, we feel that it's a very strategic approach and really easy, very easy to actually getting to what you want. So I hope, it, I hope it's helpful. And even tonight when you go back and you're ready to have a conversation, um, I hope you can apply this model. Um, like I said, I use it all the time, um, constantly, um, and I always get what I want. Before, before we wrap up, where did my Michaela go? We, I'm going to poach the mic for just a minute so Michaela can make an announcement. Michaela, who I met five minutes ago, and she asked for what she wanted, and she got it. I did ask. <laughs> okay, so I am the editor-in-chief from the student, sorry, the Journal of Student Leadership here on campus. It's run by students, and the journal is actually a hybrid journal. Um, it's international, and it's pretty prestigious, and so I just wanted to make a quick announcement really quick. So um, the Journal of Student Leadership has a deadline for December 14th, and our next issue is a special issue on women in leadership. So. For you men out here and women, <laughs> we have a lot of men excited about it, but we need submissions and artwork that is related to women in leadership. So if you have anything that you feel like might relate to the journal, um, you just Google Journal of Student Leadership and we are actually in the top five. So if you Google it, you could get published. It's a great opportunity for all the women that want to get more experience, need stuff for grad school. So if you would like to get published, just Google us. If you have questions afterward, you can come and talk to me or Anna that's sitting back there raising her hand. Um, but yeah, so let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. I, I love that. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we understand that we're different. We appreciate our differences. We honor our differences. We understand and accept we all have strengths. We understand that we can make choices to define what is power, what is confidence, that that looks differently to some people and that that's okay, and that we honor that as well. And there are simple processes and strategies we can employ to communicate better and to get what we want. But, but one thing that I wanna go back to, well, that's a good one, but let's go the other direction. Despite the skepticism, despite the, your inner critic, despite self-doubt, despite being perceived as pushy, despite potential embarrassment, despite overthinking, despite feeling unqualified, despite feeling unworthy, despite the fear of rejection, because your voice matters, because it's okay to need help, because the risk is worth the reward, because you can create opportunities, because you just might be the best person for the job. Because the worst thing that can happen is usually no big deal. Because you can. Michaela did. Because you never know until you try. Because it won't happen if you don't. Because you're no shrinking violet. Because you are an example. Because you're awesome. Ask anyway without apology. And we're done. Okay, ladies, how many of you learned something new? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay, I just met these three women this evening, uh, but they are now already my BFFs. I want to take you home with me. I'm not even going to ask for it, but I'm going to appoint you all members of my board of directors uh, because I can't wait to continue to learn um, 
um, and observe all of your greatness. Uh, so anyone take notes? So people diligently typing and writing. I just wanted to share three things that I wrote down, my takeaways. Uh, women's brain is like a browser with 752 tabs open at one time. I love that image. My whole life made sense after thinking about our brains that way. Um, uh, it's not that we lack confidence, it's we think confidence is something different. I thought that was very fascinating, comparing the male and the female. And then facts, curiosity, action, and accountability. Um, does anyone want to share one of their takeaways real quickly? We have a couple of minutes. Yes. Awesome. I know, right? How many of us apologize as we enter into these negotiations? Yes. Build your own ships. Beautiful. I love that. Yes. So do I, right? I know the, the personal home like scenario. Uh, we're going to apply that as soon as we get home tonight, right? Um, okay. Yes, and the last one. Oh, beautiful, awesome. And go, honestly, I don't remember like half of those. So thank you for sharing. Um, there was so much information packed in that presentation, yes. Mm. That's so true, that's so true. Yes, yes, so starting with your strengths. Beautiful, brilliant. So I want each and every one of you, I'm gonna give you one little task. Before you leave this evening, um, I want you to turn to somebody or go to somebody that you don't know in this room and share one takeaway uh, that you had after, after we close. Mm -hmm.